Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so this afternoon, uh, Nick Mortimer is going to be um, running through some uh, tutorials for everybody. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Nick and then hand over to him. So Nick's been working in marine science for about 20 years, and over time, he'd come to rely on MATLAB for analysis and processing. Uh, and he made a conscious decision about three years ago to move to Python and open source tools. Um, so he took small steps into Python, to Pandas, and then he noticed Pangeo. Um, and it was promising to um, allow him to do what he wanted to do with high performance computing in the cloud. So he contacted the Pangeo community um, and was welcomed. Um, and his first uh, real exposure to a community, it was his first real exposure to a community collaborating through shared goals and open source tools. Uh, he was fortunate enough to attend a Pangeo meeting at NCAR in Boulder in 2018. Um, and the community um, uh, is unbelievable. And as a result of that, um, that meeting, he applied for a visiting scientist position at NCAR and spent time working alongside um, Kevin Paul uh, and IO and workflow applications group at uh, NCAR. Um, so this community um, has been really inspirational. Um, uh, for him as an engineer at CSIRO, um, and I'll hand over to Nick. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks for that, Ben. Yes, uh, today we're going to have a quick, it's a very basic look at um, X-Ray and DASC. It's a tutorial that was made by the Pangeo team. I think it was uh, for um, American Geoscience Conference in 2019. So I haven't run it for a while, so we might come across a few issues, but we're going to use their um, my binder. So I don't know, is everybody, is everybody, I'll just look at the chat. Um, did, um, has everybody got, has everybody tried to follow that link and has that link equated to something? I'll share my screen. I'll show you what it should be looking like. So I think if you're having problems, it might be good to post in the chat. Um, otherwise, there is a like reactions yeah. button. So if things are going well, maybe you can uh, post a thumbs up. Oh, six new messages. There we go. Wow. Eventually it did. Try, but binder fails. Binder. Oh. Uh, OK, almost there. Let me. Well, there's a little picture of our 2019 meeting whilst I, uh, whilst I work to try and figure out what's happening here. Um, it was great, beautiful place. Now, so we should be getting to something a bit like this. Now, um, I posted this earlier on in here. So this Okay, so have we got a, try refreshing, it worked for me, there we go. I'll, um, I'll make a start and see what happens. Now, I'm not sure if this tutorial will go the whole two hours, um, and I'm working on two separate screens. So if, uh, if somebody is monitoring the chat, that would be great. Um, and uh, because, because I'm, just looking straight at this one. So um, X-Array, it's a... Um, Sorry, Nick, are you sharing um, a screen? Because I'm see. sharing, oh, <laughs> yeah, the other one, sorry about that, that's good. The other one, um, I had to confirm that wants to share it. There we go. So yeah, your screen should look something a bit like that. Okay. So um, what I've done is I've gone to uh, the Pangeo Gallery. I've just gone down into notebooks and I've opened the notebook xray.ipynb. Um, and it's a little introduction to um, little introduction to uh, X-Ray. Okay. How are we going with that? Are we all, is there a general consensus that it's working for people? Okay, so X-Array. Um, X-Array, it's a, 
for me, it's the workhorse of opening um, NetCDF files and lots of files. And also just for keeping my, keeping my arrays in uh, good functioning order. The named array aspect of it is really useful. Coordinates, you get so much bang for your buck by, with very little work with X-Array. So it's be interesting. If I was in a room now, I'd ask people for a show of hands, who's used X-Array before? Um, I don't know quite how we do that in this, uh, in this context. There's a reaction oh, oh, button. That one. Yeah, right. down the bottom of the screen, so people can do that. Yeah, and um, it's it's. I find it really helpful. So we're just going to set off with a, a pretty, a pretty sort of um, from the start look at this, and this is why this tutorial is really nice because it really gets you in there. So um, X-ray. <sighs> right. So well, the X-ray. So if we just have a look at this first, this first bit here, you can run this first cell. X-Array sort of based on top of NumPy. So we just import NumPy and X-Array and let's have a look and see if this is working. Yeah. All right, so we've got something working now. I'm just gonna start off with this simple, um, simple creation of a sign function. Uh, something that you'd often do in, um, uh, often do um, in, in, general, in general terms. So I'm going to create two x uh, two um, two objects uh, two numby objects. And if I just sort of type in here x, so we've got basically everything from minus uh, minus pi to plus pi, and in 19 steps. And f, of course, is the is the sign. And now when I first came to um, I came from the MATLAB world and. And you know, this is very much like how I used to work in MATLAB. We've got two arrays, we name them something useful, and then we work with them. But X-Array takes this to a whole different, uh, different kettle of fish, and we see how we can build this up. If we build up uh, an X-Array, uh, X-Array data array based on F, which is the function sign, sign X, if we run that, we basically get an X-Array object with uh, all the values in it. We also get these extra things like coordinates here and attributes, which we haven't used because, you know, we all we've done is create an array. So if we take this one step further, we could create an array and give it some dimensions. So if we create an array with dimensions, we're saying, okay, it has dimension X and there's 19 there's 19 things on that dimension. So, you know, that's reasonably interesting, but things get a whole lot more interesting when, uh, when you take this now, I'm just, I'm just conscious that I, I've got the chat up. Nobody's, nobody's, I had a friend do an entire thing like this and was on mute and didn't look at the chat and, <laughs> and uh, yes, that's good. He did the whole hour before he sort of managed to call him and tell him he was on mute. <laughs> so great. Is everybody following along? That's that's good. So um, if you take this array now, and this is where we start to get into the power of X-Array, we're going to take this array, we're going to give it dimensions and coordinates. So I'll just make that a little bit bigger. Dimensions and coordinates. So we've given it a dimension of X and we're going to give it the coordinates for x. And that gives us, uh, that now gives us a, an array with coordinates x and those are the coordinates at which we met, which we calculated that function. So this is starting to, uh, this is starting to be really useful because in x-array, there's all these extra features like plot. Um, and it tries to do its best with, um, it tries to do its best with all all the uh, all the data that it has. So if I hit plot now, this should generate a plot, which is not too bad. Um, it's not too bad. So that basically allows you to uh, to plot things a bit like pandas. It has all kinds of plotting in there, which then becomes useful to you once you've got stuff in as a uh, 
in as an X-ray object. All right, so standard, standard stuff, you know, get the 10th object, um, get the first 10 objects. Um, but also now we've got this thing where um, we're starting to get a little bit more clever. So um, we've got the select function. So in selecting, we can say, okay, let's select where x equals zero. So we're actually selecting on the coordinates, not on the integer position of an object or of a thing. So here we go. If we select there, that should give us, oh, look, lo and behold, the sign of zero is zero. There we go. Yes. Um, and then you've also got this thing like slice. You can take a slice of, uh, of the function. So we're going to go from zero to pi. So if we take that selection and notice this, we can start chaining, chaining things together because select returns, as we saw here, select returns an X-ray object. So like in pandas, every time you have the dot, you're going you're gonna to basically return an object. And that object has properties and, and, and you can work with it. So we can do a, a select from zero to, uh, to pi and then plot that result. There we go. And lo and behold, everything from zero and back to zero. So those are basic, uh, basic properties of X-Array. Now, just going through, um, through this here, we can do our standard calculations on array. On array. So we've got a, a new array and we've basically taken the square and added one. There we go. And we plot that. There we go. Now, here's an exercise. Oh, I should actually, uh, in this exercise, plot the result. This is a, uh, yeah. So you could actually have a go at this, uh, delete that, <coughs> delete the answer, and then think of it yourself. Yes. So have a look at that. So if we want to plot, uh, select the range between minus one and one, we just do this object here. Um, so we've squared it, and then we're going to select uh, the range minus one to one, and then plot marker. Here we go. All right, there we go. Okay, quick show of hands. Is this okay with everybody? How we're doing this? Is this working for you? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that was that's a fairly simple um, simple approach. And where it sort of gets more um, more interesting is when we start um, we start getting some data. So this is where <laughs> we'll see if this works. This click I haven't clicked on this for a while. So basically, what is that doing? It's getting the tutorial data from um, the GitHub. And it's a, a, a little set of, um, oh, it did that. That's good. And you should see over here, if we look at tutorial data in there, SST for those who aren't into, um, for those who aren't into marine science, SST stands for sea surface temperature. So these are files of model output, I think, of sea surface temperature. Um, Okay, so now if we run this line here, we've, we've got our data. So this is a standard way of opening a data set in, in X-Array. We're going to open a data set and that will find the tutorial. Um, and here we go. And it works. Fabulous. So in this data set, we've got um, coordinates of Latin long and time. So effectively what you've got is gridded data that's sliced up and stacked in time. All right, so, um, and you've got another thing to notice on here, you've also got uh, attributes here that tells you the source, uh, the history. You can put all kinds of attributes in there that help you uh, work out where the data came from and its providence. Um, just like you would in a NetCDF file. Well, it is a NetCDF file. There we go. We've got 12 time steps. We've got 89 
uh, latitude grid cells and 180 longitude. So in here, um, we're just going to set the output style of X-Array. This is like an option. We're going to set it to uh, HTML, which is what we were currently in. To understand that must have been, you can set this to text if you want. And then have a look and it gives you a different output like this. So it depends where you're at, um, which you prefer. This is kind of nice. If you've got, if you've got HTML, you can click on all this kind of fruit here and have a look at that. Have a look at there. Um, uh -huh. That gives you the um, attributes of that particular um, variable. So you've got latitude, um, units, degrees north, um, what, type, what uh, floating, uh, 32 point floating point. So um, yeah, let's extract, um, extract something. So each each um, data set is effectively, you can access it using this sort of dictionary style accessor, or you can ac access it using the dot style. Dot style is kind of fun um, because if I do ds dot and hit tab sooner or later, ah, yes, it'll allow me to find what I'm after. So if you've got multiple, multiple, um, uh, at, uh, multiple variables in your data set, you can find them doing that. The only thing I would say is if you are creating a data set and you create a data set called, uh, and you decide to call your variable something like, um, as, uh, something like that, it won't work with a dictionary uh, dictionary lookup. You'd have to, you, you, well, it won't work with the dot style thing. You'd have to look it up in a dictionary, something like that. Nick, we have a couple of questions popping up in yep. the chat. Yep. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll look at them. I can, I can. If you want. I... My gauge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is good. Oh, this, is, this is the first time I've done a tutorial on a, on 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 um on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Is there um well is there a difference between X-ray? Well, let's let's try it. Is there a difference between X-ray that? So if we try that, I don't think there is. I think basically what you're doing in, in that dictionary is sending in the coordinates with the um, uh, with the uh, with the DIN. So I think that will come out exactly the same. I'll just try it anyway. So if we look at this here, it's going back a little bit to um, when we were setting up. Uh, Sorry for this, I should have kept a better eye on the coordinates here. So if I just click here and press A, it will give me a cell above there, something, oh, and do something like this. There was a question about that. There we go. And this was from Isaac. Yep. So the, oh, isn't that copying for me? Right, so if I type something like this, xr dot, um, Dims equals um, uh, x like that. Um, is that the same? Well, so that uh, why is not that word there? That hasn't actually. Um, added the coordinates for me, has it? So no, it's not the same. I'm sure I'm sure there should be a way to do this in one. You could try uh, yeah. So no, it's not the same. Um, why that is, I'm not sure. I'd have to look further into that one. 
my initial feeling was it would be the same. Yes. Yeah, well, this is what we were saying. The, the question was in here was, can you use, is that the same as, as this? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, but, uh, no, can't do that either. Huh. All right. Yeah, I've always done the done the chords here like this way. I think there is a shortcut way which I can't quite remember at the moment that combines the two. Yeah. Okay, I see the chat's going well there. I will, um, I'll keep going down here. Is there any more questions whilst we're doing questions? Um, there was quite an interesting question about um, if you could uh, essentially oh, have indexing in two different ways, uh, not on two different axes, but uh, two different coordinate systems to measure the same quantity. I believe that is possible with uh, multiple coordinates. So, um, so here, if I did something like this and said, uh, uh, where can I do this? Uh, mm, yeah, I could do, uh, I'm thinking on the fly here. Um, let's have a think about this. So if I, something like that and then I want to add another coordinates um, what does that do ah no <laughs> I've done this before. Let me. Um, hmm. Ay, ay, ay. No. All right. Um, I'm being flummoxed here. Flummoxed. I'm oh, thinking about it. I have done this and uh, it's just escaping me right now. Sorry, has been depreciated. All right. There we go. All right. Well, I will. I will move on. I. You can do. You can switch coordinates between uh, dimensions, so you can have a dimension. Um, you can switch a variable into a coordinate space, um, and change the and change the index that way. So if you put a variable in as a um, as a potential uh, indexer then um, <laughs> then um, you you can do it by switching the coordinates in later. All right. Whew. There we go. So where were we up to? We were up to about down here. We're getting some data in here. Um, Feel free to help each other, which is great because I'm really struggling to, to see what's happening <laughs> in the room with us. Um, okay, so we've got our SST here. If we run this one, that should give us uh, our SST. And we've got one um, 12 time steps and the SST there. If we want to do multiple um, dimensioning, we can say, okay, let's take this. Um, We'll find this time in here, which is on our time index. So we'll select just that time and plot 
between a, a minimum of minus two and a maximum of 30 degrees. Let's have a look at that. We get a fairly nice plot there. Um, it's not too bad. Just uh, start this up over here. I'm just going to move that out of the way. Okay, so um, so that gives us a standard quad mesh color color plot. If we want to change the maximum value here to say twenty, just run it again. Um, color bar till 20. And you notice that what it's done is in, in here, you've got uh, the long name. So when we made up this uh, latitude here, it came in with a property um, standard name here, latitude. So when it comes to plotting, it reads these things. It reads the standard name and it reads the units and does you a nice plot with lat uh, longitude and the units. And over here, we've got the long name for that uh, sea surface temperature, and we've got the units that it's in. So it's trying to really help you. It's trying to really help you um, help you come up with a decent plot uh, first time round. Now, um, let me um, keep going. So if we want to uh, have a look along one particular axis, um, so along the longitude axis, a longitude axis equals 180 degrees. So that will basically look for a slice going up through, through the world that way. So if we plot that, we've got, oh, there we go. This is in time. So basically what it's done, it's taken, okay. So when I've done this, I've reduced longitude to one point. Therefore, what have I got left? I've got latitude left and I've got time. So it instinctively says, okay, I'm going to plot latitude and degrees north and I'm going to plot time because I've got those two things left. So that must be what's wanted. So that's kind of handy, you know, all the time. It's trying to, it's trying to do a good plot for you and trying to sort of help you along. Um, so if I do now, if I say I've got latitude um, 180, and longitude, uh, sorry, longitude 180 and latitude 40. I'll plot that. You're going to just going to get a line, and um, here you are. Here's the temperature. Oh, 1960, 1960. Oh, this is not. Oh, this is summer. Well, summer, winter. Ah, uh, that's latitude 40. Yep. Yeah, so it's in the northern hemisphere. There we go. No minus for that. Okay, so label-based um, reduction um, operations. So, I'm just look, I'm just going to check um, check the chat. Any um, any quick questions whilst we're at this point? Uh, no one typing. That's good. I always um, I can never remember the uh, the plot here that I always really like. Um, what, happens if, what happens if I get rid of that time there, right? And say, uh, uh, never remember the number here. Uh, this is where I always go up. Now, I always like plotting. Uh, can't remember the number. Oh, the name of the thing. Oh, it's terrible. When I'm performance anxiety. That's what it is. The um, can anybody remember? Yeah, call equals time. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. So yeah. Ah. So if I do that, it's really cool. This. Let's see what happens now. <gasps> Lo and behold. Yeah, so then we basically get like a nice, uh, a nice sort of um, plot for each each time. I think uh, is it x col equals four or something like that. 
Um, no, there's another one of these things that lets me set the set the width. Coal wrap, yeah. <laughs> ay ay ay. Right there we go. Here we go. Thinking about it. Thinking about it. Oh, there we go. So we can wrap that coal there and, and get some really nice plots without too much. Um, Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, time slider on uh, on hollow views. Ah, so going through here. So if we want to do some stuff like, okay, what's the mean SST? What does that do? Huh? Thirteen point five. It's a bit like um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer to life, the universe, and everything is forty seven. In this case, the mean sea surface temperature over that time is 13.62 degrees. So maybe not, not exactly great, but what we can do is say, what's the mean over, over the dimension time? So rather than taking the mean of everything, we want to take the mean in, in a particular dimension. And that will give us this is the mean over that one year of sea surface temperature. Okay, so what about the mean um, uh, along, um, along longitude, the zonal mean? So we can tie that by doing the dimension long, and that will give us this. So basically, what's that saying? You know, it's um, it's hottest at the equator, and um, you can see some variation um, throughout the year. I think you've got like a northern, you know, that's like summer in the northern hemisphere, and so on. So if you do the mean and longitude, we can we can actually do a mean along two dimensions at the same time. There you go. And there you go. Now, um, sometimes that's a little bit. Uh, that's a little bit funny. People like to think of latitude is always being on the y axis. So you can do that by saying, OK, I want to plot this and I want my latitude on the y axis and it will flip it for you. All right, now this is always uh, this is always an interesting one here. Um, so um, basically, if you want to do a um, a sort of a better job at this, uh, the means we calculated above were naive in that there were straight numerical means over different dimensions of the data sets. They did not account, for example, for the spherical geometries, so the area and things like that when they were weighting stuff together. It has no built understanding of geography. So in, in X-ray, it's not like there's a whole, um, a whole uh, coordinate reference system and stuff like that. It just basically says this, this array element is above this array element. Therefore, I'm going to add the two together and divide by two. So what this is trying to do here is set up um, um, we know the spacing of the points is one degrees latitude. And we're just going to basically plot the, this is the area, um, plot the area of each cell. Right. So, what we're doing here now is saying, okay, where SST is not null, that's over, over the land. Um, pixel area is not null, plot that. So this is a, um, 
This is a plot of pixel area. And then what we're going to do is create a weighted mean by taking uh, the ocean area weighted mean, take the pixel area, multiply it by the SST, sum that, and then normalize it by the ocean area and plot. There we go. Oof. All right. So um, and now um, Ben did mention in the plot um, geo views. Um, hollow hollow views, view, sorry, yeah. hollow views. There's also, there's also geo views. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, um, this uh, tutorial is basically written around um, CartoPy. Um, which is uh, basically like Matplotlib plot, but with some cartographic um, goodness in there. And there you go. So that's done a, um, a plot using um, this CRS, and plotted it on a, um, on a, a sort of better representation of the globe there. That's not bad for a, um, a quick sort of one liner, well, two or three liner. Just looking in the chat here, you've got um, right. Okay, so um, the next thing, of course, is it's it's kind of that was one year's worth of data. Now, X-ray does come with this uh, this function called MF Open, right? <laughs> I was looking at that uh, Ben and saying, "Oh, what's that? Oh, that's interesting." I'm sorry, um, I was trying to answer another question in the background. Yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah, no. I, I placed yeah. it into the chat instead of into a notebook. Sorry. That, that's okay. That's okay. Um, mm. Is everybody um, doing okay so far? Yes, it's, it's a funny thing doing these tutorials, me being the only person in the room. Um, okay, so um, this MF Open is, is, is it's a really useful, um, it's a really useful uh, for opening multiple data sets if all the data sets have the same variables and variable names in. It does get a bit tricky. Um, now, if you if you look at this here, for those people, um, uh, so um, this MF data set open, it, it's kind of, it is really good. It combines and you can combine by the coordinates. So it'll basically take the data sets, combine them by the coordinates, but there's also a, um, the preprocessor. Now this preprocessor, for those of you, if you've got problematic um, data sets that change names and stuff like that, you can actually give it a preprocessor that renames um, renames variables before they're concatenated. So if you've got like a classic one is the IMOS data where um, it started off with the data set with chlorophyll being called CHLA and then somebody changed it to CHL and then somebody changed it to uh, CHLA plus or something. So there's about three or four different names for the same variable in that data set. And you can use the preprocessors to sort that one out. So here we go. So this is saying take the tutorial data set, everything that ends in NC and combine it by the coordinates and then show me what you've got. And lo and behold, now we've gone from time 12 to 684. So if we look in our original, um, our original input here, we had, we had, um, right up here, isn't it? Um, we had a 12 time steps, one for each month. 
And now we've opened all these uh, all these files down here. And um, we've got to the point now we've got 684 uh, time steps. So now we can start doing things like, okay, um, let's group it by month and then do the mean of time. And so what does that do? What does that do? We've got now we've got 12 months and we've got a lats and long. So now we can say, okay, um, how would we plot that? So if I did that and did a, a plot, um, that SST, uh, that's the valuable there, just check that. Um, so Dask array, so I can just do plot. Um, And to see what happens there. There we go. So there's my monthly, there's my monthly uh, means. Each month plotted like that. Now that's obviously a little bit, a little bit small. So I think we had here. Stick it four in there, and. Thinking about it, there we go. Those are our monthly means for each month over the 57 years of the data. Of course, we can change the color scales if we want. So if we want to do this, this is a, a climatology plot. Unfortunately not. Now, if you if you uh, double click on the small plots, will they be zoomed in? No. What you can do at the moment, we're using output. Um, we're using the default inline. Um, oh, before coal wrap. Um, we're using the default inline um, plotting. I think if we do the other, the notebook plotting, it might be a little bit more. No. Oh, well, yeah, I'll zoom in a bit. There we go. Yeah. All right, so this is um, SST climatology. We're going to take out the climatology from the month. Um, and so this is June minus July climatology. Why that's zero there? It seems wrong, doesn't it? Hmm. I would have thought that would be that. Would be my bet at uh, June minus July. Yeah. All right. So, um, so the data that the time reference is in the date time sixty four is one of the dimensions. So it allows you to change time resampling the frequency of your data. So, um, so this time here, resample A, um, in the resample, it's a bit like pandas where you can say uh, uh, one D second, all those kind of things. You'd have to look up the resampling um, names, but A would be annual. So this is going to do an annual mean um, after it's selected a um, uh, a longitude of 300 and a latitude of 10. Here we go. And let's plot that. There we go. So um, 
naturally it stacked these two plots up together. So you've got a plot of um, the uh, annual, and it's plotted one on top of the other, the annual mean, you can see it on there in orange. And then uh, an alternative approach is the running mean, which is over one dimension and can be accomplished with X-rays rolling operation. So the rolling operation is a running sort of boxcar mean, and that's going to, you're gonna say, okay, that's a rolling mean over 24 time steps. So that would be two year time. So that's a rolling mean of two years and we want it in the center. So a rolling mean there is here. There's the annual mean. You can see uh, the rolling mean, you can see that there's sort of a, a bit of a, a bit of a shift there due to the nature of that boxcar mean, it's sliding, sliding that there. All right, so now this is gonna be tricky for me because I haven't done this for such a long time, but here's a um, here's one to try working out um, for us to have a go, is to try and work out the um, ENSO signal. The ENSO signal is a region between plus and minus five degrees latitude and west uh, 170 uh, to 120. Um, and then the cold place ocean is defined as five consecutive, uh, five consecutive three months running mean of sea surface temperature. Uh, anomalies of the El Nino 3.4 region above and below the threshold of 0.05 is known as a uh, El Nino, um, Oceanic Nino index. So have a go at that um, and have a, have a little look. And um, I'll give you about five minutes. I'll sip my coffee and I'll look at the chat and, and see how we're going. And then I might see if, um, because I can't see what everybody's doing. Maybe um, in five minutes, if you want to post your solution into the chat, I'll have a look at that. Deathly silence.
All right, is so anybody doing, uh, is anybody up further than me? Have you, um, how are we going with that? Let me just see in the chat here. Uh, we've still got more than one person here, which is good. <laughs> All right. So let's have a look at what we've got to here. Um, So we want to do the region. Da, 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 da. <laughs> okay, so. Let's take this from the beginning. So this is our data set with everything in it. So first thing we need to do is to, um, first thing we need to do is take this data set here and we have to say, okay, what do we need to do? We need to do a um, rolling, rolling mean of this. So defined as um, three month rolling mean. So if we do a, Okay, so it would be a three month would be time would be equals three. And too much pandas there. It's three, here we go. Du, 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 du. Okay. Um, ah. Right, here we go. That is more like a block. Okay, so I do a plot. Uh, what happens there? Uh, okay, so that's a rolling mean on three months. And if we take off um, the climatology, which was in here, the climatology, which was in here, we need to do a climatology. Um, So if we subtract off the climatology. That's taking a long time. Um. 
Okay. Okay, so we've got that. Uh, So let's take this. So our first thing, uh, right. equals slice and um, We need to be between pi minus five and five, and long is between uh, long is between uh, slice one twenty and one seventy. So that there would be Yeah, it doesn't like method equals in those things. Yeah, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Um, just trying to work out why that isn't. Uh, uh, like I say, it's such a long time since I've done this. I would have thought that would give me 20, 70. How's that? Nope. Uh, what's this? Uh, what's this PTS uh, there? Is that actually... yeah, yeah, yeah? That's yeah, yeah. Ay, ay, ay. My mistake. All right, so that's... let me just go back to it. Only comes me through many hours of yeah. doing the same thing myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So DS all, I should have been doing this on DS all. All right. Okay. Um, so okay, I can face a high level of embarrassment. Uh, slice one hundred and twenty comma one hundred and seventy. So that should give us a slice. There we go. There's the slice we want. And then we want to take the mean of that. Uh, mean of that. So we take the mean of that, that should um, along the, um, what will that give us? That will give us uh, uh, we want to take the mean of that along the dimension of time. So if we look at here, uh, dim equals time like this, stick it in there, along the time, that gives us, uh, uh, ooh, um, oh, oh yeah, 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 um, so, I 
that just needed me one. Um, This time, yeah, yeah, that just gives us twenty six. We actually want the um, run it the other way, we want uh want it by time, don't we? Um, so, Do that, um, take that the rolling mean, and we're going to do three months, so that's three steps here, oh, three steps there. Still got five lats and five longs, so in here. Um, have a look at that area in there. Ay, ay, ay. Stuck. All right. This should be fairly straightforward. I've done this in the past. So all we need to do now is get rid of this Latin long dimension down to one singular dimension. I'm just trying to work that out. Yeah, I think, I think the syntax might be um, when you do mean, you can pass in a dimension argument, like yeah. dim, and then um, it's an array of lat and long in there, um, the strings lat. Like so, inside an array there, like a list. Yeah. Um, square bracket. Ah, uh, square brackets. And then yeah. lat, and then comma yeah. long. Yeah. 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 Now I'm remembering. That looks a bit better. Ah, uh, nope. What? Um. Okay. Hmm. Um, hmm. Um, Ryan Abernethy, where are you now? Most likely asleep. <laughs> yes, this is true. Are you trying to summon him? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Okay. Obviously, I didn't introduce myself to X Array well enough. Here we go. Um,
go. Right. And then do arrowing and uh, Okay, Oof. how's that? I'm going to plot that. So there we go. That should be a time series of, oh, yeah. Uh, there we go. There's a, that's the mean of that area. Oh, I was starting to get, uh, I was starting to think I had too many coffees today there. <laughs> so there's the mean of that area. And then we've got a rolling time in mean and then with the plot. So now all we have to do is say, okay, that is our, um, that's our SST, our mean SST. Now we just got to calculate the climatology. That's our mean SST there. And now we're going to calculate the climatology. So we're going to calculate the climatology in the same way. If we have a look at climatology up here, climatology up here, what do we do? We did a group by month. And then we did this um, with this. Now, what we want to do is. Um, Mm -hmm. We need to do a oh, I'm not sure if we can do that. Uh -huh. How does that work? Does that do that? Yeah, no. Um, Well, so let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So let's do this. Is the monthly anomalies here, and we want to do that for a for this area that we're interested in. Uh, so we could do that. Uh, there's the area we're interested in. Time. Oh, that seems to have done that. Now, um, okay. So, what have we got there? We've got a, um, let's plot these two. Mean. Minus um, can we do that? Yep. Ah, uh, no, it'd be a Oh, it's coming back to me now. Here we go. Let's just see what is there. Okay, coordinates SST. So I have to. So that's the anomaly minus the uh, climatology. How does that look to you, Ben? Um, yep, that looks pretty good, I think. Um, I've been working on the same thing almost. 
only thing that I'm not sure about is whether we could use resample instead of group by there to resample by to resample up to three months. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. So um, that's probably the way I would have approached it. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. And that gone. The, an extension to this might be to actually try to find um, now that the anomaly is there to find um, uh, every series of five consecutive three month. Um, periods which meet the threshold um, in the data set if there are any, and probably are up that far end, maybe that all exceed the threshold yeah. of plus five or minus five. Or That's minus kind of scary, five. isn't it? That's what you call climate change at the other end of there. Yeah. So So I think here, I'll do that. Huh. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I think the issue with this might be that that might be returning, not 100% sure, but I'm just wondering whether that's returning true false. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is or it isn't above 0 0.5. Um, so a yeah. volume, but um, you could put dot values on the end and actually check um, what was coming out. Yeah, false. Yeah. Okay. So what we could do instead is if you assign, um, so if you assign all, all the your SST mean group by right through to the SST climatology bit, all the stuff before the 0 0.5, the conditional, to a variable called, I don't know, like anomaly or something. And then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I might have an extra bracket in there, I think. Yeah. And then um, you can actually do basically do that. And then you might be able to use a, uh, I think you're going to be able to use square brackets here to actually go and um, like use square bracket syntax and put that in again. So make the conditional in the middle. So actually do SST underscore a and m yeah. greater than 3.5 inside the conditional. And what that will do is it'll basically, I think it'll like- um, It'll just return me all the dates that that is. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm, it might, with it being, um, there's this 41 times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, so they're not going to be sequential. If you plot it, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like, but I don't think they'll be sequential anymore. I'm not sure. I no. mean, they'll, they'll be, it won't be a continuous series. Okay. Note to self, I should have gone right to the end of this tutorial first. But yeah. Yeah. Those are the. Uh, uh, but yeah. we could also do something with a. Um, in X ray, you can do dot where. Um, and yeah. you could set like um, the you could set it to zero or something like that. It might be possible to do. Hmm. Um, I'm just trying to think about how to do NANs, which or well, I think see, you might you just to do NANs in there as well. So yeah, if you do, I just wonder um, if you did a plot and um, yeah, plot the NANs in it. 
What will that do? <laughs> that should have converted. Uh... Yeah, that, that will do something. Yeah. Let's have a look at that. You go. Yep. There you go. So yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, so basically, um, how should I say this? Uh, El Nino is a, a problem for the uh, late 1990s, according to this, isn't it? Um, but yeah. All right. I think we should probably move on a little bit from there. I'm just going to check who's still with us. And if everybody's um, we've still got people with us, that's good. Um, how happy are people generally with what we've done so far? Before we before we move on, um, oh, I'll just go into this next bit here. Uh, so there's an indices of. So how happy are we in general? Are we, um, was that okay for an introduction? Sorry about the SST stuff at the end. Got me a little bit flummoxed, but what I'll do is I'll have a look at that and I'll, I'll, post, a, I'll post a solution in the, uh, in the chat. Okay. All right, is everybody still there? Yes, just. Okay, so now, um, there's all these people there and total silence. This is so <laughs> this is so hard. Um, okay, so let's go on and we'll just go back up to here and we'll have a bit look at Dask here. So um, let's go to the tutorial here and uh, have a look, open up this Dask one here. So Dask Summit, that's where we are. It should take 20 minutes. So um, we might have a bit of time. Oh, we've got about half an hour left, haven't we? Um, wow, that went quick, I think. Yeah. So Dask, uh, that's why we're all here. There's a little bit of a primer. Dask is a flexible computing parallel architect, uh, analytical computing, provides dynamic parallelization and scheduling. So on this one, we're going to look, uh, we're going to use the local cluster, which is in this case, you'll find uh, it's not a particularly powerful machine because let's face it, we're getting this for free. Um, we've got one worker, one core and 2.5 gig of memory. So um, yeah, our problems are going to be pretty, uh, pretty much a toy. Now, I tried this earlier and uh, it broke. So if I do this, but unlike the other problem, I did actually look at this and think, OK, how can I fix this? So here's my fix. You're going to have to type this in. Um, uh, import pandas as PD. Um, And I'm just going to get this stuff here. For some reason, somebody must have changed the data since this. Um, but pandas manages to read that data, that CSV file from the internet, and does it OK. So now we can use a little trick. Rather than doing this, we can say, um, from pandas uh, df. Now I think it's um, is it partitions or blocks here. Um, partitions, that's uh, it's either No, um, I'm gonna have to go to the um, go to the help. Uh, 
and it is, um, uh, don't want to end up there. Okay, Ooh. so on here we've got our oh, n partitions. Ah. ah, there we are. N partitions. That, bang, and it works. Okay, so you're just going to tap that in there instead, those two things we've done there to make this work. I'll just take that down, I'll stick it here just as a reminder. So that will then get this tutorial up and running. Oh. So that line, just change those lines there. So now when you do a DF, there's your structure. You've got uh, 1,405 lines and it's all in one task. So, um, we can break this up. So if you've got a big file, you can break this up into four partitions. So number of partitions here, repartition it. And that gives us basically four objects now. One, two, three, four. Um, two, three, four. And um, first object's got zero to 351 in it. And then so on and so on and so on. So, so if we want to sign the, in here, we want to find the minimum last eruption a year for all volcanoes. Let's visualize this. So now it's, you see how this is delayed. Um, what's it trying to do? It's summing up, it's chunking, getting the items from each partitions, chunking them, doing a, a split and merging them all together and giving us the answer. So that's last eruption. And if we want to actually see that, of course, we have to compute it. Well, there you go. Not knowing the data, I hope that's right, but it seems a bit funny. Okay, so that was your basics or reading a CSV file, chunking it up and doing some, doing some uh, data on there. I just uh, check, yeah. Thanks, Chris, for N partitions. And uh, that's where we are now. Okay. So we've got to uh, Dask Array. So arrays, um, it's an array, a NumPy array. If we want to create a NumPy array with shapes, with a shape, that's a NumPy array with elements. Uh, 1,000 times 4,000, and this array contains 32 megabytes of data. So we can calculate that. Bang there, 32 megabytes. So you've got basically, um, yeah. So what if we do, if we uh, create a Dask array, what do we get? You get a Dask array, which is sort of a, um, a holder for a NumPy array. And it tells you that, okay, we've got this array in one chunk. That's its uh, dimensions. But what we haven't done, we haven't told it how to split that array up. So the thing about Dask 
is we want to be able to parallelize stuff. If we if we just did that as it is, it would just be one chunk be sent off to one worker, and we wouldn't be really getting much speed. So now if we uh, create that array, but with a, a set of chunks, we're saying a thousand in each direction. If we do ones now, we'll see that it's basically chopped that up into four chunks, one, two, three, four. And if we were to do a compute on that array and we had four workers, each chunk would be farmed off to a worker and something would be done on it. So when we uh, compute, it's not gonna be that exciting because it's ones, isn't it? <laughs> So we get back ones. Um, but if we visualize ones here, we've got four chunks, one, two, three, four, four chunks. So it's run, effectively, it's run that function ones on each chunk of the array. Okay, so if we want to sum ones, let's visualize that. So if we visualize that, we're going to sum each chunk together each chunk gets summed. We do ones first, then do a sum on it. Each one of those is a partial sum gets summed up and then we get the aggregate sum. So that's a fairly um, obvious graph. Now if we run that now, um, fancy more complex, complex graph. Okay, so now we've got uh, this function here, one star ones with some um, indexing, and then we take the mean. We get a much, <laughs> much more funky graph. And you can see how very quickly, very quickly, you can see how you could hand code. You know, if I was if I was a programmer, this one here, yeah, I could pretty much hand code this up pretty fast. This one sums one. I could think, oh yeah, I can, I can work this out from first principles. I can add this together. I can make my DAS bags and work it all out for myself. But as soon as you get to this, which is a fairly, you know, it's not, not a huge, not a huge um, equation or anything, and all of a sudden we've got quite a, quite an interesting. Um, an interesting task graph. And that's where I think um, that's where you suddenly start realizing the power, power of Dask. I mean, sometimes you complain that the, the task graph gets huge and it's slow and all this kind of stuff. But gee, you know, imagine trying to do that yourself in MPI or something like that and trying to, trying to work out how to parallelize that problem. Um, it wouldn't be uh, an easy job. So, um, so let's make the whole thing a lot bigger. So this is a really big shape. This, you know, this um, here is uh, 6.4 gigabytes. Each chunk is eight megabytes. And then remember up here, remember up here when we loaded this uh, cluster, uh, cluster was only we only had 2.5 gigabytes of memory. So we're already got an array that's bigger than memory here. But I'll use more memory on this. So let's just run that. So yeah, it's big. Now, um, I'm pretty sure if I did that in, um, in NumPy, it would start failing pretty quick on this size of machine. So I'm going to do a really big calculation here, big ones, and we're doing the same calculation again, and we're going to get the results. But this time, we're going to put the compute in there. I want to see what the result is. Just thinking about it. Check the questions whilst I'm looking. Our data, so there's a question here, are data frames only partitioned along rows? Um, I believe so, although um, there is a concept of map block, but I'm not sure how that works on data frames. I think, 
I think data frames is just in partitioned in rows. Yeah. Oh, that finished. And lo and behold, guess what? You multiply something by one and, you, and everything's one and you take the mean of lots of ones and we get the stunning answer one. And that's what we call using CPU time to prove that one equals one. So um, all the usual NumPy methods work on uh, Dask arrays. You can also um, apply NumPy functions directly to Dask arrays and it still be lazy. So here's a NumPy, we're taking the cos of one and then we're squaring it and then we're taking the mean along access one. What does that do? Up, oh, reduce. So reduce hasn't actually been um, computed. All it's done, that's the delayed object. So if we did the um, we did the uh, visualize here, took this and visualized down here. Like that, what would that draw us? Oh, 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 that could be quite tricky for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, that probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. I just realized how many chunks we had there. That's going to be one of those horrendous graphs. I'm going to stop that if I can. Okay. Um, so yeah, here's here's that graph, um, and you can see how 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 far it goes on for. All our chunks there. This graph, I mean, it is kind of useful, but after a certain size, it, it really does become a bit meaningless. Oh, I just get that back to size. Okay, so um, just setting some parameters of the default figure size. So if we had to plot to reduce big ones, let's have a look at that. So plotting it, like it says, because it has to display the data, it, it triggers off a, um, a compute, which can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Often um, you have to be a little bit wary because if you compute something, then plot it and don't save the data every time Every time you uh, hit plot, you're computing it, which can be a bit uh, time consuming. There we go, stunning. Okay, so DAS delayed. So um, here's some interesting functions here, um, these, these time sleeps have just been added in there. So these two functions do a simple operation like add two numbers together, but they sleep uh, for a random amount of time to simulate real work. So we just want to sleep a bit. So what we're saying is uh, increment, increment x, return x plus one, sleep for ten, uh, tenth of a second, decrement x, sleep for tenth of a second, or add the two things together, sleep for 0.2 of a second. So if we time that, that should be 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So roughly about point, oops, sorry, uh, run that cell, run this cell, roughly about, oh, 0.4 of a second, 400 milliseconds. So there we go. So in Dask, we can add the um, decorator to it, delayed, which turns the function into a delayed function, otherwise a lazy function. So what happens there? If we, if we now turn those functions into a lazy function, all of a sudden, you say, wow, you know, we've done really well. Um, we've done really well. I mean, look how fast that is, but it hasn't actually done the compute, of course, it's all it's done is return us delayed functions for later, later, um, later computation. 
So here we go. So we've got ink, ink, the two things are separate, ink and deck, and then we add one. So when we call compute, let's have a think about this. Um, we had a 0.4 of a second last time. So in my book, if this, um, if these two take 0.1 of a second, those two should go in the same time, 0.1 to get past this step, and that should be 0.2. So in theory, I reckon this should be about, I'm going out and think, oh, I thought it would have been faster than that. Um, oh yeah, uh, it's just point, uh, all time 0.42. Okay, let's start uh, saying, how about having a look at the client? So here, here's the dashboard. So if I click on this dashboard here, that will get us the, that will get us the, the dashboard. So um, I'm just trying to put that, uh, it's a bit hard with everybody. Okay, so if we open the dashboard here, that should give us the time. Uh, it's not letting me tile it on this side. Well, I'm going to put it on the other screen so I can see it, but you can't see that screen because I'm not sharing it. So yeah, I'm just watching. If you watch your... Um, if you watch your task, uh, your DAS status there, you should see. Go down here. Uh, when I do this here, visualize and compute. You run this here, and you'll see bang, bang, bang. There it goes. <laughs> ah, a trick for young players here. I was thinking like, why is this so slow? Um, let's go back to um, let's go the back to the top here, and let's just have a look at our um, our cluster. Notice that we got one worker and one core, right? So we're never going to get anything in parallel here, right? Uh, because if we had two cores, we could do the addition, the ink and the subtract at the same time. Because we've only got one core, it takes exactly the same amount of time. So I wasn't, I wasn't sort of losing the plot. I just hadn't looked at the compute facility that we had. So in this point here, there's no real speed up from using uh, DAS because we've only got one core. We can't actually farm the work off to two cores. So that would explain why that um, reduction in time is not there. Okay, so um, um, so in this one, um, we're basically uh, passing this persist thing. So in this instance here, what we're doing is um, we have a, a list uh, ZS as a list, and each time round this, um, each time round this uh, loop, we're taking this loop and we're saying, oh, that's a, a lazy ink and a lazy deck, and then are we going to add those two lazy functions together, which is Z, and then we append it into the list, and then we can compute that list. And if you watch your um, if you watch your status graph when you hit this when you hit persist, it will trigger the computation. In there we go, and it's going away now. It's triggered it in background, which is kind of nice because I don't have to wait for it. But uh, actually, I'll move this over here, and you'll be able to see it. Here we go. But you'll notice that the task stream this is pretty meager because we've only got one core. So it's, um, yeah, it's just basically a series of um, computations.
Uh, thanks, Krill. You, you did post that there's only one workers so and no parallel execution yet. Yeah, and we can still start more. Yeah. So yeah, there's only only one. There we go. So that was a uh, that was a quick look into uh, into Dask. Um, I hope um, hope that wasn't too confusing. Uh, it's a while since I've worked through these um, tutorials. There's lots of tutorials as you can see on um, on on here that we haven't touched on, like intake. Intakes a, a, a really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting cataloging system um, that I think is really really useful. And you'll see, um, you know, this is a this is an intake catalog. It's a it's a YAML file that basically describes a, a series of um, a series of um, data sets and files. And what it's try what intake is trying to do is trying to um, the idea of intake you, you attach it to a data set and it always returns you a Python object that's ready to be worked with. So it might return you a pandas data frame. It might return you a uh, X-ray object. It always returns you a, or a geo pandas object. The idea is it returns you with a, a geo panda object or a, a Python object since it's removed all that boilerplate code. That when you were in MATLAB, you used to write loads of code to load stuff up and do things. That's all um, included in the uh, in the intake driver. So you can have a look at that. Um, GeoPandas is uh, you've heard me talk about pandas. GeoPandas is a geo reference uh, is a is a uh, pandas sort of time series analysis spin off, which is um, as geographic coordinate systems in there. It's really handy for handling stuff like um, shape files and uh, anything with geometries in, um, really handy because it has roughly the same kind of, um, the same kind of uh, axiom as pandas does. All right, so that's, um, that's nearly the end of, of where we're at. To uh, I value your feedback. If you want to, um, if you want to ask some questions or um, just uh, um, or anything, that'd be great. Um, thanks for sticking with it and um, and hanging out. And uh, tomorrow's another day.